Hey, everybody. Welcome to Mavens of Data. This is a brand new format for us where every week we're going to have a live show with some of your favorite data experts sharing their best advice to help you grow your career. Today, we've got an awesome topic, how to build a personal brand in data. By the end of this show, you're going to understand how a personal brand can be a major advantage for you. And you're going to leave with some actionable advice and tips so that you can literally, right after the show, start making progress building your own personal brand. Before I put our amazing guests on and introduce them, I want to hear from the audience. I'd love if you could drop into the chat and just let me know on a scale of one to 10, where do you think your personal brand is right now? That's going to really help us understand who's in the room, and then we can tailor the conversation so it'll be most valuable for you. So. With that, let me introduce our amazing, amazing guests here. Uh, these are two people you probably already know. They've built huge followings in the online data community. If you've ever been to a live event around data, I'm sure you've seen them there. They're book authors. You might have the books. Um, two people that have just built amazing personal brands, and it's been a really big advantage for their career. So there's nobody else who could uh, advise you on this topic better than the two of them. We've got Kate Strachny, the founder of Datacated, and Kristen Kerrer, the founder of Data Moves Me. Uh, Kate, if you could kick us off and, and just do a, a little intro, uh, tell us about yourself and, and say hi to the audience, that'd be great. Absolutely. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. And John, thanks for hosting us as your first episode here. Really an honor. Um, as, as Jan mentioned, my name is Kate Strachny. I'm the founder of Datacated. And Dedicated is essentially a media company where we've partnered with over 100 clients in data analytics and AI space to help them with brand awareness and content creation, content amplification. We do virtual things. We do things in person. We've got the data vendors. There's a lot going on. I have written a book called Colorwise. I've got courses out on my platform and LinkedIn learning. And I, I have evolved over the past several years where my background was actually used to not being data, it was in risk management, financial services. Um, so over time, I've had to shift my own personal brand from being a consultant in that space to working with data directly to now um, running a media company that is focused on data. So I'll pause there. And yeah, that's yeah, a that's, quick glimpse into my life here. So That's awesome. Thank you, Kate. And, and for our audience, Kate actually has a course out right now, I think two or three days ago, it just launched. That's on this exact topic, building a personal brand. I'm actually gonna put a link to that on the screen right now. Um, Kate, if you could just say a few words about the course so folks can uh, see if they wanna check it out. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for doing that. So I just launched a dedicated brand builder. It is, it's $10, so it's pretty affordable in my opinion, but it's a way for everyone to get started with building and growing their personal brand. It is 100% email based. So that means you're not joining an academy. You don't have to, log in or sign up, which I think it causes a lot of friction for people who sign up for a course and then sort of drop it and don't complete it. This uh, version, you basically get an email in your mailbox every day for 10 business days, uh, along with lessons of the day, you've got expert tips, and then you have little tasks or mini missions, as I like to call them, where you actually have to do something to make progress on building your personal brand. Awesome. So yeah, grab that link, check it out, save it. Um, if, if you're interested in this, this webinar, you're, uh, you're definitely interested in that topic. Thanks, Kate. Um, Kristen would love to have you say hi to the audience and give your little background. Hi, I'm Kristen Kerr, founder of Data Moves Me. I've been a data scientist since 2010. I started doing econometric time series analysis and forecasting in the utility industry, moved into healthcare where I was uh, motivating people to get their colorectal cancer screenings. Then I really got my start in e-commerce. Uh, and when I started at Vistaprint, John was actually my boss for like the first two days. Uh, and through doing, working on, you know, site analytics, product analytics. At the end of that stay is really where I started working on my personal brand, which we'll talk about in a bit. Uh, and I spent some time also working in the ML ops space. And now I am writing a book, Machine Learning Upgrade, a data scientist's guide to ML ops, LLMs, and ML infrastructure. Uh, and 
For Data Moves Me, I am currently building an LLM powered app for a consultancy, and I do a lot of influencer work as well as a result of building up my personal brand. Awesome. So for folks in the audience, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kristen. Um, Kristen's superpower is she's really, really strong technically. She stays current on all this stuff, but she's also off the charts in terms of communication. So like that's the exact type of person that you you want to learn from. So this this book, I think it's coming out in August, Kristen. Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So um, so I put a link up here to that. If you're interested in machine learning, guaranteed to be uh, a fantastic one for you. Uh, I'm sure you're going to love it. So grab that link and um, uh, and check it out. All right. Uh, before we get into the meat of the discussion, I want to cover a few housekeeping items. So first. The show is going to be recorded, and you will uh, you'll get an email after probably a few hours after the video is um, is all processed. I know you'll ask anyway, but we like to say it at the top here. Um, next, we are going to try to save some time at the end for live Q and A. So please ask questions. There is a questions tab down at the bottom of your screen. That's the best place to ask questions. That's where we're going to look at the end to uh, see what we can answer for you and, and upvote other questions that you like. If, if we're short on time, we'll prioritize kind of the most popular ones. Um, and then finally, we'd love for you to connect with us. We're very uh, active in the online data community. Uh, Kristen, Kate, myself, Maven Analytics, we're, we're all over LinkedIn sharing tons of information that we think you'll find valuable. So go find us there. And we've also got lots of videos on YouTube. So um, check that stuff out. And now let's get into the meat of the discussion. So we're talking about how to build a personal brand. These are some of the questions that we're going to be addressing for you. Uh, we we definitely going to cover a lot more stuff and we might not go totally linearly. It's going to be a free flowing conversation, but I promise we're going to hit these ones at least. Um, Kate, it'd be awesome to kind of ground the conversation maybe with you starting off. How do you define a personal brand and what does it look like? when somebody's done a good job building one. Yeah, thanks, John. I think um, the, ba the, I guess the basic way to describe what is a personal brand is what people think about or talk about when they're thinking of you when you're not there, right? So John leaves the room, Kristen and I are here and we're like, oh, the Maven guy. Like that's what comes to mind, he's the Maven guy, right? Like that's, that's what I associate you and your brand with. He does analytics, he does data, and he's a great podcast host, right? Things that come to mind. Um, so that's essentially your personal brand. And some of us have a personal brand already that we build just by either talking about whatever it is that we care about or posting content on it or working on specific projects that pertain to a specific thing. Like if you're always working on data visualization, talking about data visualization, writing a book about data visualization, chances are that it's your personal brand. Uh, but I want to point out that whatever brand that you're not born with, but whatever brand that you have right now, doesn't mean that that has to be your personal brand. So when you're you know, sitting in the audience, I saw lots of zeros out of tens, two out of tens, very low into, you know, in response to your question, John, of where people are with their personal brand right now. If you're at that stage of trying to define what it is you want to be known for, I think now is a good time to really jot down a couple of ideas, five words that come to mind that you wish people would think of when they see your name, they see your face, like, oh, Kristen, oh, machine learning, cool data projects, right? She was writing a book. Um, she's awesome. She's one of my best friends. Ooh, okay, yeah, so <laughs> different things come to mind, right? Um, and one great way to do that is to ask people that you know, that know you really well, like, hey, what comes to mind when you hear my name? And if you're not hearing the things you want to be hearing, then maybe you need to shift a little bit in terms of what you're talking about, the content that you're sharing. So it's more in line with what you wish people would think about when they think about you. Yeah, that's that's fantastic. Um, thank you, Kate. Uh, Kristen, I'd love to hear your thoughts. How important do you think having a personal brand is like right now, 2024, today's market? Like wh where does that rank for you? I mean, it's it's so incredibly important right now. We're constantly hearing right about how difficult it's become to get a job and how flooded it is when you try and apply, especially now since COVID and a lot of companies have gone remote, just the, the competition is more. And the way that you are able to 
really position yourself well there is to have a personal brand because although i am not an expert in psychology at all like it is a lot of psychology um when a company is looking for somebody obviously they have a need but when you are applying to a job right you're showing that you have a need as well right so it's a different dynamic than if somebody reaches out to you because they've already decided in their heads that you might have the skills that they need it's it's a real dynamic shift so if you can be on that side of the table if you can get things coming in inbound that's going to position you way more well for just even the perception that people have of you in interviews and for negotiating later on when you're having salary conversations <clears throat> and it extends even further that like if you want to start your own business and you now have work opportunities coming to you for contract work like that makes it a lot easier for you to start build something up so that you can go out on your own so i'd say you know it's always been important it's always been something that will help you in your career but especially now with remote work it's like more important than ever yeah that's that's awesome totally agree with that and i think uh, it makes me really interested to hear this is probably a question i'd love to ask both of you maybe kate if you could start um, as you started to build your, your personal brand, like, and don't think about right now where you guys have these massive audiences and people, it, it's, it's really humming for you, but like, as it was getting started, what were some of the moments when you realized like, Hey, this is working and you started to get some of those benefits that, um, that Kristen was talking about, like where, where it started to make a difference for you in your life. I'd love to hear some of those anecdotes. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Happy to share that. And I'll start with a story that I've never actually sought out to build a personal brand. So this was about 10 years ago. I was shifting my career from financial services, consulting, risk management type work into data. And as I was learning things, it was Tableau at the time. I was trying to learn how to use Tableau, what good looks like. And I was studying for an exam. So I posted something on LinkedIn and I said something like, hey, I'm studying for this certification, just put it out there. And that was sort of one of my first posts I made in the data realm. And a couple of people responded. And that was kind of a big moment for me where I realized that people are helpful. There is a community out there somewhere. And it sort of lifted a couple of the fears that I had within me of like, OK, somebody might see this and what are they going to say? I didn't put anything out there that was crazy, but even a small question like, hey, does anyone have prep materials to help me prep for this exam was already major. And that sort of kept me coming back to the platform. And now to Kristen's point, it, it came to the point where the following started to grow and people kept following the journey. Um, I was not an expert by any means. I was truly a beginner in the space, trying to pave my way, make my way. And I think that's sort of what attracted some of the audience members because they were also growing and it's, sometimes fun to grow with someone versus watching a complete expert post to their, you know, brilliant thoughts online. So what I started noticing was as the following grew, my personal brand grew, uh, I sort of became this opportunity magnet where all of these crazy, great, amazing opportunities were flowing into my inbox all the time. And I can, we probably don't have enough time on this call to list them all out because in the, the past, let's say seven, eight years, there are a lot of opportunities that have 100% come to me as a result of having a strong personal brand, mostly on LinkedIn, but on YouTube as well. That's, that's fantastic. Yeah, Kristen, I'd love to hear from you, like same thing. When did it start clicking and when did you start really feeling the value of the, the effort you were putting in? Yeah, so same like Kate, I didn't set out to create a personal brand. I saw a friend posting on LinkedIn a lot and I called them up and I was like, what are you trying to do? Like be Mr. Popularity on LinkedIn? Like <clears throat> it was almost like a joke. And this person was like, you have to write a blog and you have to post it on LinkedIn. And I'm just one of those people that's like, oh, well, you know, I'll try anything once, whatever. So I thought about, you know, my experience in work and just what I had strong opinions on, because that was what was going to be the easiest for me to write a blog. So I ended up writing about my opinions on um, behavioral customer segmentation, because, you know, you always have marketers coming to you and they're like, we're going to do segmentation. It'll be these segments, right? I was sort of running through the whole like, let's you know actually use data to inform this and so i write this blog article and i post it on linkedin 
and like nobody cared. I got seven likes. And the following week I was presenting at WPI because I go there um, sometimes annually to talk to the master's in statistics students about just my career and stuff. And so this was how to get into data science. And this was 2018. And so since I had this slide deck, I was like, okay, well, I'll just write this into a blog too and I'll post it. And it took off. Right. And so it just became this thing that was fun. I didn't know where it was going. Um, I don't know why I had such a desire to like start connecting with these people that I don't know when like I really wasn't setting out for this. Uh, but I met Kate. Uh, she sort of roped me into uh, there was like a group of eight of us that did a live show like once a month or whatever. Data science I, office hours. I remember that. Office hours. Yeah. Uh, and I started to really grow. And actually, I was a, a LinkedIn top. I was number eight LinkedIn top voice that year. So showing up and being consistent, uh, I really was able to, you know, sort of get myself recognized and and as, you know, part of the people that were going viral on LinkedIn. Um, and so I'm not sure if I fully answered your question, um, but I sort of stalled there for a second. <laughs> no, no, I think, I think, uh, I think that was perfect. Yeah. It's great to understand like where you were starting to get traction. Uh, so you both mentioned LinkedIn. I'd love to hear, um, Kate, maybe we go back to you. Like, is LinkedIn the best place that you think folks should be focusing? Are there other places too? like, how, how do you, how do you think about that? I think it depends on where people feel comfortable, right? In terms of the types of content they like sharing. So Kristen mentioned she started with blogs and LinkedIn used to be a great place for blogs. I think now it's more of the Substack and medium. If you're trying to do long form content, LinkedIn is still one of my favorite platforms because that's where my people live. And that's where people sort of go every day or multiple, multiple times a day to say hello, to check the feeds, to engage and connect. And they all use their real names for the most part. They have their companies associated with them. So they tend to behave a bit more professional and nice. So I do like that. Um, and YouTube would probably be my, my second go-to platform because of the evergreen feature where some of my content from like six, seven years ago, when I was still like teaching people how to use Tableau is still sort of trending and getting lots of views where on LinkedIn, if I post something today, then by tomorrow, it's not relevant. Next week, it never existed, right? It's like, it's great in the moment. And it's a great way to treat it maybe like a business diary journal where you're documenting what you're working on, what you're who you're meeting, uh, photos, you know, it, it's very flexible. But for those who like short video form content, TikTok, YouTube shorts, Instagram reels, I have not found too much success on there because it's not exactly my style of the being, I, I'm not that fun to be on TikTok. I don't know, not yet, maybe one day. I don't know, what do you think, Kristen? Yeah, um, no, I agree. And the, the data community is really everywhere. So it depends on where you wanna be. Like there's a great academic community on Twitter. Um, mm -hmm. I was a top 3% karma earner on Reddit last year. And for me, I found that, you know, if I really want, I built a, a computer vision model to detect the school bus going by my house and send text alerts. And when I had questions on that, if I posted on Reddit, I'd get a ton of really relevant technical replies that actually helped me to move forward. Or I found that if I posted, you know, computer vision, if I'm doing pose estimation or something fun, like a little video demoing it would go wild on Reddit. Um, I found that on Instagram, that one was like a little bit more difficult to build for me because you just always need an image, although the algorithm has changed on LinkedIn so that text plus image performs really well. So a lot of times now on LinkedIn, you're using an image anyways. But back in the day, it was like, oh, man, I need like lifestyle images of myself to go with my to go with my data post. And that was like a lot of additional work. But so there's just communities all over the place and you know they have a different feel they all have a different feel on TikTok it's like a lot lighter it's a lot less technical and you can sort of just go around and find where the fit is for you at this point with 95,000 followers like on LinkedIn I'm a, I'm a LinkedIn lifer you know like that's my that's my home 
Um, that's where I've done really well. So I'm going to like hammer down on that. It wouldn't make sense for me to move someplace else. But if I was just starting out um, and there's even like, you know, more technical ish um, data communities as well, like Dev2, there's, you know, there's just other ones. And so, you know, you might want to take some time and find out where do you want to build your community? Yeah, I just... Yeah. Very quick question to the audience, if that's okay, John. Um, I want to ask, so for, for folks who are not maybe even producing content just yet or creating content, where do you tend to consume your content when it relates to data and AI? Is it LinkedIn? Do you go to YouTube, Twitter? Is it Facebook? For some people, it might be Facebook. I'd love to just hear and, and, and see what comes in because I'm curious. Sorry. Over to you, John. <laughs> no, that's great. Yeah, we're getting getting LinkedIn, YouTube, Twitter. Yeah, a lot of LinkedIn. Yeah, um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, I I found LinkedIn, I think similar to what you said, Kate, is like it's people are professional, they're nicer. Um, yeah. I also I use Reddit a ton just as a lurker because I, I find a lot of value as a learner in it, not just about data but about all sorts of topics I'm interested in. I think it's it's like so valuable. It's topic focused. Kristen, real quick one. I'm curious, and I don't want you to dox yourself here. Um, but like on Reddit, in terms of building a personal brand, do people know who you are or are you more anonymous on Reddit? You know, that's like a really good question because I post projects that I've obviously authored and I'm not yep. anonymous about that. And I will share my YouTube videos and I will share my articles that I write um, that obviously like breaks my anonymity. But at the same time, I am posting under uh, you know, anonymous name. And yep. I, I partake in a lot of things that there's probably, a, and I don't have a huge following on Reddit either. Um, but I've gotten a lot of engagement. And so there's probably some people there who know exactly who I am and, and a lot of people there who don't. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, I, another question here, uh, and I'll go back to Kristen, to you again, you mentioned kind of when you were getting started, you, you made a post and like nobody saw it and it kind of, you know, sometimes that can feel defeating for folks who are just starting out They're They're probably going to encounter that. Like the, all three of us definitely encountered that like, many times. Um, when that happens, like what would be your advice for somebody when they're, you know, feeling that for the first time, like, what would you tell somebody? Yeah, I think one of the most important things, sometimes you can tell when something is going to be a winner, but for the most part, like you never know what the algorithm is going to grace you um, with great visibility. And so you might just have like posting at certain times works better. Like there are there are times that will do better for you. Um, and just you know, knowing that just because you wrote about one topic and it didn't do well, that the next topic won't. And so when you're trying to figure out what you might want to write about, you know, I said for me, I thought about what I have opinions about. And if you, you know, need content ideas, a lot of times too, if you're working on something at work and you have to do research and you find a great article on that topic, you can also just share and say, hey, you know, I found this article while I was researching X, Y, and Z. It shows that you're working on a data project. It shows that you, you know, are researching, that you know a bit about what you're talking about and you're sharing something that is going to help other people. And don't worry about thinking that maybe it doesn't look technical enough or it's not, you know, savvy enough because there's always going to be people who are before you in the journey. And uh, people love getting, like if you're doing something out there that's going to help the community, I often find that that performs better than like strictly talking about something that only applies to yourself. Right. And then, you know, there's other types of content as well, but there's like so many different things for you to try. Um, there's so many ways that you can show up to the community and you're going to start to learn that like, hey, if I'm sharing something that's helping the community, that's probably going to do better than than certain other things. Um, and not just don't get down about any one piece of content, because sometimes you can put your heart and soul into a piece of content and it just doesn't do well. And, you know, maybe it's just Oh, I've got an I've got a really good example of that actually. So when I was working in ML Ops, um, the big thing there is often, you know, uh, 
data tracking, data lineage, experiment tracking, and which is a super important topic, right? And we really care about the reproducibility of our models, whether it's because you're, you know, potentially going to get audited, or because you need to later be able to roll back to a previous period, all the reasons, right? Um, uh, nothing I ever wrote about reproducibility was sexy at all. Like no one, like I, it, like it's one of those things that after a while it's like, okay, like I'm just going to accept that this is not a topic that most people are resonating with. And that's why you see a lot of, a, a lot of posts too on like SQL things that everyone is doing. Those resonate with everyone. And so everyone is able to get involved. Right. And so when you start to shift how you think about creating content and you try a ton of different topics, you start to find the things that work for you. And then as long as those match with what you're trying to do in terms of your personal brand, you can really hammer in on it. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I, I love that you kind of focus it on adding value to the community and, and being with with that as kind of the major goal. And I, one of the things that I think is interesting is like when that works, it goes really wide and a lot of people see it and a lot of people get value. And when it doesn't, nobody sees it. And it's so it's even when it's like an embarrassing flop, it's on such a small scale, right? So your best stuff is is really something you could be proud of. And the flops literally nobody even knows about. Um, it, I think you can you can get confused if you're just looking in the the LinkedIn feed because the posts that you see tend to be the ones that go the widest. That's sort of just like the definition, how it works. So you think everybody has these these real big hits. But if you actually go to any of those creators, you know, their their individual posts, you'll see you just saw the best ones. You know, um, they they tried a lot of stuff that didn't work. So like don't get discouraged if not everything goes wide. Like Kristen said, shoot for adding value to uh to your audience and sometimes it's gonna be a home run sometimes it's not but uh but the embarrassment is usually pretty pretty small so um that's awesome i'd love to yeah take no. an audience question if um if that works uh, kate we can we can go to you here uh this is from syed what are some good types <laughs> of content that uh that folks could be aiming for okay yeah thanks for the question syed um i would say First, defining what good content means to you. And, you know, going back to what Kristen was just talking about, experimenting and the, the fact that you, some of your posts might do really, really well from an engagement and impressions perspective, and some might flop. I think it, it all starts with what your actual goal is and what you wish would happen. Are you looking for 100,000 views on a random piece of content? Or do you want, you know, with random people viewing it? Or do you want, 100 very relevant people who truly care about what you're saying, especially if it's, you know, a business post and you're trying to promote your products, chances are you'd be happier with 100 views of the buyer looking at your stuff versus 100,000 people of, oh my God, look at that funny thing John posted. Like, no, like, okay, you entertained someone for a second and then they kept scrolling and you got the, their impression or their like, but what are you really trying to get? So I think first defining what good content means to you and then experimenting, right? What does your audience tend to react to? There are different types of content that you can put out there. I'll use LinkedIn as the main example here. You can do text, you can do polls, you can do articles, you can do a whole newsletter, video content, live streaming. There's just so many directions you can take this in. And I'd say experimenting um, and then your audience will literally tell you what good was by either engaging or commenting or fully viewing your content, you'll get that feedback through the analytics. And don't get discouraged. I think my motto is that a post that you never posted has a 0% chance of giving you any opportunities. And a post that even if it flops, in your opinion, still has that like tiny percentage of bringing you something awesome in your inbox. Yeah, the inbox yeah. is big, right? It because is. there's a lot of work opportunities that I've gotten that it doesn't come from the people who are liking my post every day. And I've got some people that, you know, no matter what I post, they're going to like it because they, you know, are supporting what I'm doing and it's great. But those aren't the people. Yeah, girl. And I got you too. <laughs> but those aren't the people that are in the DMs. The people that are coming into the DMs to talk about potential work opportunities, those are people that are lurking. You know, they're part of the, you know, reach metric, not the engagement metric. I want to talk about the lurkers for a minute because yeah, sometimes I'll be at a conference and someone will come up to me and say, Kate, I followed you for five years. I read every single thing you wrote. And I'm like, 
I've literally never seen your name, your face. You've never engaged with any of my content. I didn't know you exist, yet these people know me so well. You're right. The majority, the vast majority of people are lurkers. And similar here, you know, we've got 120, 130 people on the stream. Are they all commenting? No, they're passively watching, maybe taking notes, maybe getting ideas. But not everyone has that first intuition to just start engaging or commenting and posting and liking. And some, they might love everything you do, but you'll never get an actual like from them. And that's okay. But you do have to remember that they exist. And most of not all my opportunities have come from those who have never engaged with any of my content. Yeah, that's awesome. Those those extra impressions are real, you know, and they're they are making a difference, even if you don't get the feedback as the the uh, poster. So I see Dom awesome. is Dom Barry's lurking as we speak. So that's awesome. Um, so both of you talked about LinkedIn as being super important. I'd love to put a poll up here and just hear from the audience again. So um, so we've got a poll here, which I think uh, I'm I'm new to this poll functionality. So let me see. I, can you guys see it on the screen, Kate? I think we have to click on it. Yes. So it's a little notification that comes up and we have to click on it. So I'm going to, I'm going to answer. So the question is how many times a week do you actually post on LinkedIn? Um, this goes to yeah. the lurkers out there who are probably going to say zero. And by post, we mean provide actual original content. This is not a repost. It is not a share. Just to be clear as you're voting, I'll submit my vote as well. Awesome. Yeah. So we're, it looks like we're getting a lot of folks who are, are at zero, one to two, um, you know, 80, 90% of folks are just generally not active. Right. So, um, so even taking some initial steps here are, it could, could make a big difference for, for folks in, in kind of that 90% bucket. And then a, a small number of people that are, you know, in the three to five, five plus good for you that you're already out there building a personal brand. Um, yeah. let's, I'd, I'd love to talk about, how to actually get started you know think think about the person in the audience who says they're posting zero times a week they're probably like not totally sure what to post about they might be a little anxious about putting themselves out there for the first time i definitely was like it was very uncomfortable for me i started doing it when we thought linkedin might be a good strategy for maven and mm -hmm. um and i was super nervous about it and hesitant uh, so I'd love, like, what kind of advice would uh, would you have for for folks who are just getting started? Maybe Kate, we'll go back to you for this one to start, and I, Kristen, I'll, I'll want to hear the same from you after. Yeah, I think first is trying to uh, understand some of your own obstacles that you've placed in front of yourself of what is actually stopping you. So if you've never ever posted, do you not think it's important? You know, thinking through that, and if you don't, then I hope we've convinced you in this first thirty minutes of the session that it is important and uh, can bring you lots of great opportunities and job offers and book deals and speaking gigs and just friends in general. Like it could just bring you lots of great stuff. Um, and I think if you're at the point where you understand that there is importance in creating content on social media, then the next thing is you probably have some fears that you need to overcome. So if you think, and I ask this from the family members and close friends who are not content creators yet, I asked them, I'm like, hey, so you keep saying you want to create content and you want to post. So why are you not doing it? And almost every single time it's like, well, what are people going to say when they see it? I'm like, haha, jokes on you. After your third post, you're going to say, why can't people just like look at my content? <laughs> because you'll notice that the first few posts are not going to skyrocket, right? I think we all think the whole world's going to see it and judge us. So then my follow up question is usually, okay, let's say you're colleagues will see it. That's usually the main concern. It's interesting. My coworker will see my content. I'm like, what do you think they're going to do next? And they're like, well, they'll probably keep scrolling if they don't like it or they like it if they like it or they, they'll engage, but that's probably they're just going to move on with their day. I'm like, there you go. Like it's not a huge deal. So I think getting over those fears and then the very next step is, and I'll encourage everyone on this um, show to do this today, maybe right after this, if you can, is to create your first post and just see what happens. Treat this as an experiment with an expectation to not succeed in a big way, right? So just post something. If you learned something from our conversation today, um, you can tag us, you can create a post, we'll engage with what you put out there. Um, it, it doesn't have to be too difficult. And um, last, last thing I'll say here is content is not a huge article that you spent eight months working on. It doesn't have to have code and images and graphics and like 
all these research. No, it could be a one sentence post. It could have an image. It doesn't have to have an image. If you saw the power of the poll right now, like if most people are not here asking questions, the vast majority answered that poll. You can run a LinkedIn poll that generally does really, really well compared to other type of content just because of the simplicity of getting people to engage or they're like, oh, I have an opinion, A or B, like they'll pick something. I can spend a whole hour on this. I'll stop because I, I really, I get excited about getting people to start. So hopefully that landed with at least some of you and you'll actually get your first piece of content out today. Yeah, Kristen, what about you? What would you tell that person who really needs that push and is is trying to get started? Yeah, so, you know, on the coworkers topic that Kate mentioned, because I'm sure that that is a thing for a lot of people, you know, my boss, when I first started, he knew I was creating content and he was completely supportive of it and um, maybe probably regretted it later because it only took me nine months to build up enough work to go out on my own. <laughs> but even just today, you know, I said I'm building an LLM powered app for a consultancy. And so just today I was talking about the latency of this app. Now I do have an NDA. So I just sent the post to the person who's managing my project and asked like, hey, is it cool if I post this? And he got back and said that it's perfectly fine. And so my personal experience, and of course people have, you know, will have varying experiences. I'm sure that there are people out there who aren't okay with it. But my, my experience has been that people are somewhat, um, like supportive, they want to see you building a personal brand. It looks well on them. It gets the name of the company out there too. People, when they see Kristen Carer, like, you know, throughout the journey that I've gone on, um, they know what I'm up to. And, uh, you know, some other things, like if you're looking at getting started and you're wondering how people are making these pictures with the little animations that are on. A lot of people are using Canva. It's super easy. It's point and click. I have the premium version, but the, the free version has a ton of functionality. Highly suggest you play with it. And then, you know, other things like I mentioned sort of throughout the show, like oh, I really thought about you know, what do I have an opinion on? What are the things that are frustrating you at work that you can then turn around to sound slightly more positive so you don't sound like a Debbie Downer and share in a way about like, you know, the solution on how you think that things could go better or less um, intimidating content to share about is like I said, you know, you find an article while you're working on something, you share how it could be helpful to others, um, or even just like sharing your great accomplishments. If you get a promotion at work, like when the people who post zero times a week, like you've probably gotten a promotion before, or somebody has given you a pat on the back, say, like it, exploit that. Talk about why, you know, oh, you know, this, I <laughs> had this a uh, great day at work because I, so-and-so didn't uh, said I did an amazing job on this demo because of X, Y, and Z or whatever, and just start showing yourself out there. And sometimes that one is the most scary because it's hard to talk about ourselves and our accomplishments because it feels like this ego thing. But at the same time, there's just so many other people out there doing it. And it, it really does show other people what you're doing. So there's just so many different ways that you can come up with ideas for content. And then you want to be thinking about like, like Kate said, you don't want to be working on a blog article for forever. Like what can you wrap up and get out the door tomorrow? Um, or in the next 10 minutes. And um, Kristen, I just want to add one fast. last thing. To your, <laughs> if you're not quite ready to put a post out there, because sometimes there might be employee restrictions where you might be a little nervous if your employer doesn't want you sharing original content. Uh, another loophole is the comments. Uh, it's, it's generally a safe way to get your feet wet and give yourself a challenge of commenting on 10 relevant pieces of content per day. So people you follow, people you like, people that talk about the things that you like talking about and that align with your personal brand, leaving a very thoughtful comment can actually bring you opportunities as well. Like I know people who only comment, they don't actually post yeah. that much original content and we still get to know them through that conversation. So instead of just like opening up the door to a, you know, a store, you're kind of going into other people's stores and introducing yourself. And it's a little bit easier. Um, and then if you're still not ready to do that, if you think that's putting yourself out there too much, inside that inbox where Kirsten, Kristen said that the power of that inbox, right? You can have those conversations as well 
with people yeah. more privately if you have some of those restrictions or if your fears are just too massive to overcome that quickly. And I know yeah. a couple people that Kate is talking about when she says just commenters, like I know. know these people and I know who she's talking about. <laughs> Yes. And and those people like they still have built a brand because like you literally you know who they are and you wouldn't if they weren't engaging in that right so it's it's so interesting it's it's not a one size fits all solution there's and I, I agree I think that comment is um it's maybe a little bit less intimidating than hey putting out your own thing also the person who's who's posting the the post that you commented on they appreciate it too right they want discussion they want to get ideas so it's it's very welcomed and um, you know, it, it's a great way to, to build a relationship with that specific person and have other people see your brand as well. So that's, that's pretty fantastic. Yes. Um, well, and I've had people take comments that I've, I've gotten tremendous engagement on comments before, and I've had people take those and screenshot them and make it as their own original post with my name on it and then tag me. So, you know, you never know where it's going to go either. No. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's awesome. So I think uh, it's probably a good time to just get into uh, a little rapid fire Q and A here. Before we get into that, I'm going to post the um, the links to uh, Kate's course and Kristen's book again. We also have uh, another offer that I'll put up here specifically for people who showed up to this uh, this webinar uh, live event that I'll, I'll put here for Maven. Um, so right now you can get a Maven Analytics unlimited membership for uh, the, the cheapest that we offer. We, we do twice a year, we, we put our courses on sale. We, um, we don't do it very often. We, we do have a sale right now, our spring savings event. Um, so it's, it's rare that we have a sale, but actually right now uh, through this link here, folks who are on this webinar can get a deal that's even better than this rare sale that we do. So you can get an entire year of unlimited access to Maven Analytics for $199. The normal price for a year is $349, and you get unlimited access to all our courses in Excel, SQL, Python, Power BI, Tableau, and more, um, guided projects, uh, the data playground. You can build your own portfolio and put your projects out there. So grab that link if you guys are interested, um, and, and check out the links to uh, Kate's course and, and Kristen's book as well. Um, so let's jump into to some of these questions here. There, there's a lot of good ones. Um, Kristen, how about this one for you? This is from Leandra. Uh, should I avoid sharing non-data related content to protect my personal brand? So maybe opinions you might have about the environment, supporting topics, help requests from other people, other things that you find interesting. Like how would you how would you answer that question? It's a really interesting one. Yeah, no, I think it's perfectly fine to share things that aren't necessarily related to data. Like I know that Kate shares about running. I share about gymnastics. Um, there are definitely things, but you do want to be very careful because if it's like a hot button issue or whatever, you might turn other people off. So you need yes. to really think strategically about, you know, the the outside of data items that you're sharing and, you know, um, just like, yeah, you, you need to think strategically, but it's certainly something that you can do. And in general, people like to know you better and know what your opinions and interests are because it makes you more of a human, right? So there's some level of that that you do want to be sharing. You just want to do it in a careful way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's really smart. I mean, back in the day, Michael Jordan said, um, Democrats buy shoes, Republicans buy shoes, like don't really can't have an opinion on that, right? Because you'll you'll alienate half of your your potential audience. Um, so yeah, that's I think that's really smart to so just be a little careful, right? Um, there's I think there's a lot more downside than upside in some of these like uh, aggressive topics, or not necessarily aggressive, but like hot button topics, you know. So yeah, there's certain things awesome. I'm not talking about. <laughs> yeah, no, it's I think that's that's very um, very wise and measured. Uh, Kate, how about this one for you? So this is from Lucas. Should I share my LinkedIn posts in targeted groups after initially posting them like a Power BI data analyst group, sales managers group, or should you solely concentrate on using hashtags? Oh, really interesting. This might be controversial, but I will say none of the above. So I've stopped using groups and I barely use hashtags for... Mm -hmm. Because hashtags are... And I'll start with that one first. Interestingly, people create their own hashtags like 
I don't know, Maven data or something, right? That maybe that you're going to use that forever and maybe you're not, but, or blue shirt, hashtag blue shirt Thursdays, I, I don't know, Wednesdays. And you might think you're being fun or creative, but the way hashtags worked before was people were following the hashtags and you can actually go on LinkedIn search and see, you know, are there six people following the hashtag or are there six million people following the hashtag and then picking hashtags based on followers to actually get relevant views was helpful. I did hear that hashtags are sort of phasing out. And I think if you're going to use them, probably use two or three and use them at the bottom of the post. So it's not like it doesn't seem robotic in your content where it's like, hi, I'm working the hashtag data visualization with hashtag this group. Like it, people don't really like to read the hashtags. Um, and then in terms of groups, I have seen a significant decline in engagement in some most of these groups, actually. And I think that's because people maybe the algorithm has gotten better where you're getting the content that you care about already. So what was the point? What is the point now to go into those groups? I think about five years ago, that was a big thing. I even had groups of my own that I managed and we had tens of thousands of people in there. And then sort of the engagement just flow back to like the main news feed. So that's where I would say just keep posting maybe three times a week on LinkedIn and use the relevant words because people are following words as well instead of I think the algorithm will show you things. If you use the word data, you don't have to actually hashtag data. I haven't seen a significant like change either way if I use the hashtag or if I didn't use a hashtag in terms of engagement and performance. Yeah, so. on that. So I used to use hashtags. The algorithm has changed a bit. I don't use hashtags anymore. Completely agree with Kate. But at the same time, you may want to search certain hashtags when you're getting started to sort of see what other people are posting on that topic. If you're going to write something on machine learning, type in machine learning, look at the content, see what's getting engagement. Um, and that can help you as well. So maybe don't use them yourself, but like leverage them to help yourself out. Just one last thing here, I do use them for events. So if an event has a specific hashtag, because then it's easier for me to also find all the stuff pertaining to an event, like an in-person conference where you're like, everyone use this specific hashtag, then I tend to use it. But other than that, I rarely use them. Awesome. Yeah, great, great answers there. Um, this this is another really interesting one. And I think, I think it's going to apply to a lot of people. We touched on some of it before. But so I think, Kate, you, uh, you talked about when you were getting started, you felt like you weren't even necessarily the expert, you were the learner and you still built a brand around that. And I've seen a lot of people do that same thing. And so this is Richard's question. And I think, I think it'd be great for you to answer. Um, how can you overcome self-questioning your own brand? He sees himself as a pioneer in working with others, but at the same time, he knows there are many people who know a lot more and have had more chances to do what he wants to post about. So he's not feeling like the expert. He's really talking about how does he get started the same way you did and like, how did you overcome that doubt? Yeah, I think I overcame by fully, I guess, owning up what I know and what I don't know and putting that out there. So I would just come out and say, hey, I'm just learning this Tableau thing now, if anyone can help me. And then even in my tutorials, I would I would say I'm, I'm sort of a beginner, but here's what I figured out. And here I'm sharing how to, you know, do a a black background dashboard and I taught others how to do it, even though I'm a beginner in many areas, I would pick up a skill and sort of share that with others. So I think being transparent that you're not the ultimate expert. And then you know, when you think about it, who really is the ultimate expert in anything, things change on a, such a regular basis. And then back to like, I think both Kristen and I mentioned earlier in the conversation, people generally don't want to just hear from the experts. They want to hear about what you're struggling with, what challenges are you overcoming? And then you also have a very unique perspective, right? You're in a specific industry, maybe in a specific company, facing very specific challenges or successes or have fun stories to share from your own point of view. And no one else can do that. So only you can be you. So that's that's sort of how you own your brand. I think Dr. Seuss said that, right? You're the best you that there will ever be. I don't know. I don't know that quote. <laughs> Alan, you look like you know it. I don't know. <laughs> that's I, I was trying to, uh, Chris and I are both in Massachusetts and there's uh, Dr. Seuss Museum. I was trying to calculate who was closer to uh, where Dr. Seuss came from. And I think it, I think I might be a little closer, but, uh, but yeah, yeah. Great, uh, great advice there. That's awesome. Um, let me, let me throw another one out there that I think is, is really interesting. And uh, uh, Kristen, it'd be great to get your take on this. So this is from Lainey. 
Um, what are the various avenues to build personal brand? Obviously posting is one way, but what else? Like, is that it? Like, where would you rank posting online versus like doing other kinds of activities? How, how do you think about that? Oh man, I do so much stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, certainly going to meetups is fantastic. And it looks, it, it depends on the type of relationships that you're looking to build. Because if I go to a meetup that's local and I meet somebody who's working on something similar, now I have someone close and we have that bond of like being in the same area and that helps. Or if I go to a conference, even if it's not close, right, I'm meeting people who are interested in the same thing and we might have like, an amazing chat and exchange business cards and follow up. Um, you know, and there's just like so many different types of content that you could be creating. And that's going to really be based on what it is you enjoy doing. You know, like I have Camtasia for editing videos and I'm, you know, I have a fancy camera and the fancy microphone and I do live streams and there's just so many different avenues. And actually, while we're here, like, um, I'll also mention too, that if you start really getting into content creation, you'll want to think about creating an email list. Because, you know, when Elon took over Twitter, there were so many people who had spent all this time building up a um, building up a following that like could have been gone the next day, like completely wiped off the earth. And, um, and now we're talking about potentially restricting TikTok. I haven't been following up on that, but again, like, again, we are in a situation where, you know, a, a, a platform might be impacted and people who have spent a ton of time building a brand may go away. If you have an email list and, you know, at the end of your blog articles or on your YouTube videos or in your comments on your LinkedIn posts, you have a way for somebody to sign up for your email list. If a platform goes away, you still now have a way to contact them. And, and the way that you'd want to do that is to offer them something. You wouldn't just say, hey, sign up for your email list. You'd say something like, hey, I share similar their tips on time series analysis on Tuesdays if you join my email and I promise not to harass you. Don't word it like that, but that's like the, you the word it like that. that. I love that word. <laughs> But that's sort of the gist is you're offering somebody value to give you their email. And then you have a sense of security that if one of these platforms ends up um, ceasing to exist, you are not, you know, all this effort was not for naught. Kristen, did you see Stephen Smith said, always have a BCPDR plan. So business continuity plan, disaster recovery for your personal disaster brand. Disaster recovery. Nice. <laughs> That's it, though. I agree. The email is extremely important because you own it. You don't own the, the platforms. Yeah, that's that's perfect. That's that's a really good one that that I wouldn't have thought of. And now, just as you're saying that, Kristen, I'm I'm thinking of some folks that that talk about data that have done like a Substack or other things like that. Which I think I think some of them are doing free. I know, yeah, Kate, you have a Substack, but but even like folks who have smaller audiences that just kind of wanted to start talking. Um, and I'll, I'll subscribe to that and get some interesting information. And those people really stay top of mind because they're, they're in my inbox. So that's, <clears throat> I think that's a really, really good pro tip. That's probably not a crazy heavy lift. You know, it's, it's yeah. some of the same content you're already creating and you're just distributing it in another channel. Oh man. <clears throat> awesome. And so Jason just made a comment, pro tip, building a project portfolio is a great way to build your personal brand. And that's literally like all I do. I have my bus detector. I have my LLM apps. Maybe that was, you know, a contract I did for somebody else, but I also have this blog and the majority of it is running you through different how I did projects or whatever. And then when I go to interview with a company, I now have a repository of all these amazing things that I've built that I've also organized my thoughts on how I'm going to share it with people too, because that's, you need to put the effort in to, if you just build something and you don't think about how you're going to position it, you could also go into an interview and flop. Um, but for me, like building in public has been a, an amazing way to, um, like that's, that's, that's sort of the, the biggest piece of what I do is build in public. Yep, that's that's awesome. All right, so we're we're almost out of time. I want to take one more final question because it comes up all the time. This one's actually from the chat. Shivani says, what about people who have the qualifications and the experience with projects but don't have any work experience? Any tips for somebody like that? Maybe, Kate, if, if you could give some tips and then 
Kristen, it'd be great to hear from you too. Yeah, I think creating your own project to work on is probably the first thing I'd recommend. And when I was heavily focused on data visualization, visual best practices and storytelling, and that was my main focus, what I would always tell people to do is get some data you actually care about, create those portfolios using mock data. It doesn't have to be fake data. It could be real data. There's so much data available now. And with ChatGPT, you can actually get synthetic data. You can create something for yourself to work on. It helps when it's something you actually care about because let's say you're in an interview and you need to showcase a project and maybe you, all your projects are top secret and you're under some NDAs like Kristen has, I know for some of her work, then creating a project that you can freely talk about in an excited fashion, it really helps come across in a really positive way for the interviewer where you're not like, oh, I worked on something, but I can't tell you about it. Or I know everything, but I have never actually implemented it in real life. That's also tough. So b build something for yourself, maybe two or three things. I would I would say don't try to create 30 different projects. Two or three is probably ideal of different types of projects um, that showcase the skills that you think your future employer would really like. Awesome. Yeah. Kristen, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, so the work I did in computer vision, and so like, I'm a tabular data machine learning person, you know, my master's degree is in statistics. I've never taken a course on computer vision, but there's, you know, parallels and, and self study. And I started sharing my work. And I was getting DMs from people like asking me if I wanted to work on projects that were like, you know, detecting things on x-rays for like way, way out of like, no, like I'm not qualified for that. But through sharing my work, you do start to, and the portfolio too. So, so sharing the portfolio online does bring people in. I now have like friends too in the computer vision area. So like, if I wanted to do something over there, I believe I probably could study up more and like break into that through just through sharing the projects that I have and the project portfolio. Like if you can go into a job interview with one or two working apps that like, I mean, I, so it totally, if you're going to be a data analyst, like no, but um, you know, if it's, if it's relevant to you or there are different types of projects that you could either speak to, or if you can like show a working app and you're going for like a machine learning job, like that is, that is amazing. Um, and so it's, it's so, the portfolio is so valuable. And, you know, even if you don't have work experience, and it's very difficult for me to speak to this because I was in data like long before it, it got popular. Um, and so it's much more saturated now and I don't have the experience of, of starting new in this environment. But I do see people landing jobs because they have portfolios that show hiring managers how they would be able to be successful at doing that role and that they understand answering a business problem or i mean especially if you could do a project if you're going into like marketing analytics and you could find a data set that has to do with like yeah. ltv um retention or um mixed marketing analysis like mixed market um, I, I don't know why it's not coming to me now, but like, you know, certain areas that are business problems that they solve, like you're, you're, you're just showing them that you're ready to, to do that type of work. Yep. Yeah. It's fantastic. I mean, what a good question to close on because the answer is, you know, working on projects and putting yourself out there and showing what you can do. And that's, that's really the core of, uh, of building a personal brand. So before, um, <clears throat> before we say goodbye to everybody, I just want to um, talk about what's coming up next for, for Mavens of Data. So next week, we've got uh, Matt, Mike, and I'll, I'll post a link here too so that, uh, so that everybody can see the, uh, the link to, to register for these. Um, you can click that link. You can go register for each of these events. So Matt, Mike's going to be talking about the skills every data analyst needs. Matt's awesome. He's a relatively recent transitioned um, teacher that's, that's coming into this space. Um, and then next, uh, two weeks from now, we'll have Alex, the analyst. He's talking about all things AI and where he thinks that's, uh, that's going to take the, the data industry and what it's going to mean for our careers. This is a topic that like everybody's 
interested in, some people are terrified by. I think he's done a lot of thinking of it, and it's that's going to be a really fun discussion. And then the week after that, we'll have Annie and Ian, and they're going to be sharing their advice on how you can break into and thrive in your first data role. So um, hopefully you guys can click that link, go register now for, for anything that you're interested in. The other thing that I'll do um, real quick is I will also, um, I'll drop into the chat, I'll drop these, uh, these links one more time to, um, to Kate's new course on brand building, uh, the machine learning book from, from Kristen and the, uh, the Maven analytics, uh, super awesome deal that, um, uh, that, that, that we rarely do. And then the final thing I'll say is, um, for, for anybody who wants more totally free content, Maven analytics has these two free courses that, that you can take anytime you just sign up. You don't need a credit card. Uh, Data Literacy Foundation is a great place to start if you're you're sort of just getting your feet on the ground. Um, and then ChatGPT for data analytics, where we cover use cases in Excel, SQL, Power BI, um, tap, uh, and Python, and, and more. So um, with that, I just want to say thank you first to everybody who showed up in the audience, uh, really engaged group. We, we loved hearing everything from you, and, and especially to our two amazing guests. You guys rocked this. I think you uh, explained to people how valuable this was. And I think most importantly, they got a lot of tips that they're going to be able to literally right after this call, go and start making some progress. And it's such an important topic. So thank you guys so much. Um, you're the best. Thanks for having us, John. This is fun. Yeah. Thank you so much. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye.